There's a lot of deep truth in those simple words, life is worth living just because he lives. Sometimes you just need to be reminded, believers, what you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And those songs definitely, definitely praise the Lord. Thank you for just uh, sounding like you love the Lord this morning. It's, uh, it's good to be together and uh, praising God in the temple, house to house, continuing daily with one accord. I thank the Lord for you and for the Word of God working in you, the Spirit of God working in you, and singing praises to the Lord. Hey, Milt, I could hear you all the way up here. Praise the Lord. Still got a little something left in the tank? Bless the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. We're going to go into Galatians 5 here in a moment. Um, we're still free to live faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We uh, embark on a mission tomorrow as a church. We will get together uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. for the, the team of people that are going to be working in VBSC. And of course, it's going to be 120 degrees every day. Thank you, God. Ah, no more rain. Yay. Nice and hot. Yay. Everybody's going to be whining. No. The kids might be, but that's all right. They'll be fine. But we prepare tomorrow for our regional mission trip. Vacation Bible sports camp. And Tuesday morning, there will be a couple hundred little children running around. And uh, they'll be having a great time, and uh, the mom and dad, the moms and dads will be trying to figure out where to, where to put them. And as we've communicated uh, to them what to do, we always have wonderful surprises on those mornings. So uh, praise the Lord. Looking forward to it. Uh, it's much anticipated. Of course, last year we did not have EBSC. Uh, but, of course, we've, uh, from uh, 2017, 18, 19, we were able to do uh, our sports camp, Vacation Bible Sports Camp, three years, and then we did not do it last year. We're back. And so, praise the Lord. Um, the T-shirts look really, really cool. So I thought that's important. And uh, the adults, they look good, but the kids, they're going to look so fun. But we're looking forward to Game On, the theme this year, Isaiah 40. Verses 28 through 31, game on. And uh, you can be praying. Please be praying for us, praying for the children, praying for all of us, and uh, pray uh, that the old guys that are over 60 make it through. And uh, pray. <laughs> we're looking forward to it so much. Last week we looked at uh, the first six verses of Galatians 5. Galatians 5, I just want to give you a, a quick reminder uh, a quick review, as it says in verse number one of the chapter, stand fast, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. And of course, we looked at that from the perspective of, hey, sometimes we really, really want to get our walk going, which is very important. Our faith walk in the Lord, we've got to get it going, but sometimes we don't even know who we're standing on and what we're standing on, and we need to stand fast in the liberty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we stand fast in the Lord, then our faith is an overflow, our walk is an overflow because we know who we stand in and what we stand on. But unfortunately, sometimes we get that a little mixed up. And then when we waver and we have a tough time, uh, we're not really standing before we walk. We showed a little video of my grandson Gabe and Gabriel showed it perfectly. I wasn't taking that video for anything other than to watch him walking. He's 14 months old. He goes everywhere. He's got like 10 feet and 10 legs. And he can get anywhere, anytime. And then when he was staggering and wandering and wavering, he just kind of plopped down. And that's kind of the way sometimes we are when we don't stand fast in the Lord. And since our stand in the Lord is a little mixed up, our walk then ends up being so weak and wavering that when we fall, we don't stand back up. We need to learn how to stand. And Paul is teaching us through that as we had chapters number three and four. They were powerful. We covered them for a few weeks on all his arguments about how the grace of God and the, the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ 
And the grace of God is what we stand upon. And he showed us the historical argument, the personal argument. So we have a, a, just a little bit of review of a background of how Paul right now, he's, he's set this all up. He's given great doctrine. Those 60 verses from chapter 3 and chapter 4 are so strong. They're some of his strongest writings. He then says, hey, how do you put this into your life? A lot of you pray that. You say, how can I put all of this into my life? Well, here is this grace wherewith you are saved. Here is this liberty in Christ that's made you free. You choose God over man, faith over works, grace over law, because that's what saved you, and that's the way we're supposed to serve the Lord. And so Paul says, this is the way you ought to live it out. And I'm thankful for the word of God. It is, there's no better place to go and there's no more practical teaching in this whole world about anything in life. But of course for you and me as believers, it's, believers, it's even more so. It's our necessary food. It's our bread. It's our nourishment. And as we learn how to stand before we walk, we now go into Galatians chapter number 5 verses 7 through 12. And we now sit down here in this passage and say, okay, we're going to take on just a few more verses Take on six more verses and kind of say, okay, is this liberty wherewith Christ has made us free something that's really working in my life? I mean, our conclusion last week and our invitation was, hey, are you going to get stuck and tangled in that yoke of bondage of trying to find the lo- fo- follow the law so that you can please God? Or are you just going to please God by faith and say, Lord, I love serving you. Lord, I love following you. Lord, I'll do all that you would ask me to do. In fact, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. And I don't have to be in that place of following the law, being legalistic, and, and having my lawyer card out that would make God happy when he's saying, hey, I just want your heart. I just want your life. You don't need to add works into things to please me. Your works are a reflection of your faith and how much you love the Lord. Look at verse number 7, 8, 9, 10. We're going to walk through it and read it together. Let's read this passage of scripture, and then we'll break it down a little bit, have a little bit of an introduction, and then we'll, of course, make some practical application. Chapter number 5, verse number 7. Ye did run well, who did hinder you, that ye should not obey the truth. You think for a minute and you go, okay, if he's saying ye did run well, ye did run well, kind of a uh, past tense thing. Kind of like you used to be a good ball player. (laughs) Now what happened to trouble you? Age. (laughs) People say, boy, you played in the big leagues for a little while. Yeah, I played for two different teams. I was even traded for once. I was like, you know, they... They threw me in on a deal, and they just like, you know, a dozen of used baseballs and some broken bats. I was the player that was thrown in. He said, well, wow, you pitched in the big leagues for two different teams. You must have been pretty good. Why didn't you stay? Because I wasn't very good. So you're reminded that you did play well. You did run well. So think spiritually speaking, there was a time where you ran well. What happened? Great question. Who hindered you? Don't forget this. We'll be back to this here in a minute. Who hindered you? That you would not obey the truth. Verse 8. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Persuasion. There's a lot of positive connotation in the Bible about persuasion. This is a negative statement by Paul saying, This persuasion of not obeying the truth, it came not of him that calleth you, which is the Lord. This way that you're choosing to live is not of the one who called you to salvation. He continues in verse number 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. We'll get into that here in a little bit. It's a great principle. Jesus taught it in Matthew 16, and Paul's teaching it here as well. Verse 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord, that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. So here's this, hey, who hindered you? Who's troubling you? Sounds like familiar language, doesn't it? Because Paul's saying, hey, you need to identify who's messing with you. We're going to look at that in our introduction and our conclusion. Verse number 11. And I, brethren, fellow believers in the Lord, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? 
I preach truth of the word of God where circumcision belongs and how it works. Then is the offense of the cross ceased? We'll look at that here in a moment and what he's really saying. He then takes it on in verse number 12 and says this. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Boy, that's strong language. Now, Father, we're getting into your word once again on our Sunday worship gathering. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we desire your work, your handiwork this morning. You have yourself in the spirit of the Lord position, responsibility in God head to teach us this morning. So we ask you to use your word to teach each believer here exactly what we each need to hear, what we need to have that goes into the into the depths of our soul and our heart, the joints and marrow. We need to learn from you. So God, take your word. We do want to hear from thee. We do not want to hear from man. God, you are the only one that can teach anyone, every one of us individually. That's what we pray for. Please, right now, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When you think of this passage, again, it's only six simple verses. There's not much there. Well, I don't know. I think there's a lot here, just like last week when we covered six verses. So when you think about this question, who did hinder you? You're going, wait a minute, what? what? I guess there's someone that's messing with these people still. We've talked about him a little bit. There is legalists. There are Judaizers. There are Sadducees and Pharisees. There are false teachers. There are people that are teaching the incorrect doctrine and naming their name and saying, hey, I'm of God. But there's one other. That really is the one who's doing the false teaching. His name is Satan. So let me ask you something. Simple question. Would you ever invite Satan to your house? Well, that's, that's pretty tough. Simple, clear. Of course, the answer is no. I, I, we're not answering. We, we were, no, we, I'm not, I am not inviting him here. We never would. But who is it that's hindering you? Who is it that's troubling you? Satan was invited by God to visit Job, was he not? He also visited Jesus Christ, did he not? But I would not voluntarily say, Satan, why don't you come to my house and have a meal? No, no, no. In fact, the simple definition of the devil is that he is a false accuser. He's a slanderer. He's one that's prone to slanderous things. In the definition of Satan, he's the adversary. He's one who opposes another. The name given to the prince of evil spirits, the inveterate adversary of God, the one that's always going to come after the things of God, and he's going to come after Christ. He incites apostasy. From away from God and to sin, to sin, he is totally and completely the one that orchestrates everything from the start. Why would I ever invite him? I never would. So then let me ask you this. Then why would you invite someone into your life? See, Paul's saying you're inviting someone into your life. You're listening to somebody. You're listening to a voice. A voice is teaching law. Over grace. You're listening to someone who's teaching you to follow man and not God. Why would you invite someone into your life whom Satan is using to bring opposition to God? Believers, I... I fear that we don't attend to the people that we allow into our lives the way we ought to. I'm not talking about not witnessing to people. No, no, no. You witness to them. You talk to them. 
You give them the gospel. You're the one by the Spirit of God having control over you that's leading you to have conversation and make relationship and connection so that you can talk to them about Jesus Christ. But you're the one that lays the groundwork. You're the one who determines how you're going to interact. How is it that we would invite somebody into our lives whom Satan ends up using to bring opposition to God? Think of the people that at times in your life, at different times, you allowed to come into your life, some of you, and said, no, no, how did I get to this place where things are mixed up and messed up? How did I possibly listen to them? Well, Paul's saying, churches of Galatia, Galatian believers, Galatian people, listen to me. There's somebody that's messing with you. In fact, they're bewitching you, they're hindering you, and they're troubling you. Because consequently, many believers are being bewitched. Hindered. And troubled. Now, I didn't make those up in my quiet time with God. I took them from the Bible. As I often say, if you want to be a good communicator of the Word of God, just repeat what God is saying. This is what God is saying. Look at Galatians 3.1. It's up on the screen. Oh, foolish Galatians. Remember, we looked at this before. Who hath bewitched you? Who in the world is it that you have heard from that's bewitching you, that ye should not obey the truth? You know what it means to bewitch? In fact, it's the only time in the Bible, remember, that it is spoken of, the word bewitched. Who's bewitching you? Who's messing with you? The word bewitch means to speak ill of one, to slander to bring evil on one by feigning praise or an evil eye, to charm someone falsely, to bewitch them. Foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched, bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Here's where the religious people come into your life that say, hey, this religion that I have is better than the one that you have. My legalistic teachings are better than the grace of God. He will be pleased with you if you just follow my ways. It's not this incredible satanic obviousness that sends a message clearly in front of you. It's the deviousness of bewitching that charms you into saying, hey, you have a neat, neat little belief system. Can I tell you my belief system? And let me mess with your belief system. That's what's happening to the people of the Galatian people. It happens today to you if you don't have the... Uh, awareness and the ability to see the obstacles and ward off that stuff coming into your life. Galatians 5, we just read it, verse number 7, up on the screen. So, bewitch, now hinder. Who hinders you? Who hinders you? Similar type of statement. What's the word hinder mean? To beat back, to set back, to stop progress, to beat something back as if the course of a ship was being altered by waves, by current, by, by weather. Now you've got this walk going with the Lord. You're obeying the truth. Someone brings in a wave of religiousness, of legalism, of, of some type of thinking. Maybe it's just false doctrinal teaching like clearly Paul's saying that it is here. And they hinder you from the truth of the word of God, that you would not obey the truth. Let me give you another way. It's like saying, okay, when he's preaching on the liberty in Christ, you can't believe what that pastor's saying because you know that liberty says that he's basically saying you have a license to do whatever you want and God will forgive you. I've never said that. And God never said that. Liberty in Christ is that you are free to please him. You don't need me to regulate your behavior. If you open up your Bible and learn how to love him like he said to love him, it might change your life. You won't have to worry. Well, I wonder if Steve Bryles thinks that I am a good Christian by him watching my outward appearance. That's an infectious legalism way of thinking that God is going to determine your holiness by somebody else watching your behavior. That's baloney. But we're drawn to that. We have a propensity to that. I sure hope that all those people at the church see how cool and neat I look today. We don't like that in us, but we're drawn to that. And that hinders you from obeying the truth. 
Because Jesus says, I gave you a new commandment. Woo. You ought to love like I loved. Because I laid down my life for my friends. That's some kind of love right there. He says before, he goes into 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Charity. There's nothing better than that. Prophecies, you got them, they will fail. You're speaking of great words. It's like tinkling cymbals. Don't forget the last verse of chapter number 31, chapter number 12, just before 31, when it says, I will show you, I will give you a more excellent way. The more excellent way is his love. You see, what hinders you and me? What gets us stuck is that we are so operational in our flesh instead of being operational in the spirit of the living God by his word. It's a beautiful place to live. It's so much different. And you and I know the conflict. But when I choose his liberty where I've been made free, oh my, then the one that comes to trouble me is put aside. Because here's verse number 10 up on the screen. We have been bewitched, we have been hindered, and we have been troubled. The word troubleth here. To agitate, to trouble someone, spiritually speaking. To cause one inward commotion. Take away the calmness of the mind. To agitate. I know that sometimes, and I, I shared this in first service, I, I was reading the definition of this and I went, Phew. How many times have I caused a commotion and agitated people and troubled them for the wrong reasons? And then joked that, hey, my middle name is Agitator because I'm the centerpiece of a washing machine and I'm an agitator. That's not a good thing to be. Because when Satan gets a handle on things, when the devil messes with us, it says in the first part of verse 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none other mind, otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. You know, whoever troubleth you, he'll face his judgment one day. So, in looking at the meaning of the truth of the word of God and seeing what words are used in your Bible, you probably have no difficulty uh, landing on the fact that the name of our message or the title is hindered, that we're hindered. We are hindered. And we need to look at how we are hindered and how much we need the Lord Jesus Christ to free us, to unhinder us, to unbewitch us, to untrouble us. And that's Paul's really pertinent practical teaching here you stand fast you stand before you walk and now as we deal with this idea of being hindered we realize something really really tough and that's this when I look at the word of God when I'm reminded of what the word of God says when I'm reminded of how God says hey why would you add any works to my grace? Why would you think there's a better way to go? Why would you think that I haven't done everything in the Lord Jesus Christ? It's everything. I've done everything for you. Up on the screen, you see the outline of our first six verses last week. We found that our refusal to obey the command brings some tough stuff. And that's what we looked at last week is that that command in verse number one is stand fast in the liberty or you'll suffer consequences. Christ won't profit you. You'll be a debtor to the whole law. You'll be fallen from grace. You'll be living in a life that's just basically, even though you're a believer, it's not you losing your salvation. It's now I'm not living by the grace. I'm living by the law to please God. It's not, again, I'm fallen from grace no, when you're saved, you're justified completely by Jesus Christ. You're not justified by the law. Paul is not dealing with the security of the believer. He's basically contrasting the law and the grace. And so we looked at that all last week and what happens when we refuse to obey that command. This week, just in our, our first few minutes of, of really looking at the, the text of the message, I want you to see that there are some characteristics of false teachers. Just to alert you, verse by verse by verse, 
what does a false teacher look like? The first one we find out in verse number seven. Ye did run well, who did hinder you? What do they do? Not just the devil does it, but the devil uses people to hinder you from the truth. They mess with you, very simply. They say this, well, the security of the believer, that's pretty good, yeah? You say it's once saved, always saved. Oh, so now you're tritely speaking of God's incredible power that he has made happen through the justification in Jesus Christ and the circumcision and the cutting away of my soul so that now, in spiritually speaking, I am secured by Ephesians chapter number 1. And in the Bible, it teaches a course of the security of the believer, Romans chapter number 8, and on and on it goes. Well, let me mess with you a little bit. As a false teacher, I can point out a few verses that would take away from the truth, and they would twist who God is, and see, since God had really not a whole lot to do with your salvation, he definitely would not have a whole lot to do with you losing your salvation, since you don't really believe what the Bible's saying about security of the believer. Hang on. Those that hinder you, they will twist the truth every single time. Verse number 8 tells me that those false teachers will not be of God. They are not God people. Again, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. They're anti-God. They're anti-Jesus Christ. They are a person that acts like they don't believe in Jesus Christ and how he is truly the son of God and the son of man. He is God incarnate. They are not of God. The third thing you see is that they will contaminate and corrupt the whole church. False teachers will do that. They've been doing it for decades, for centuries. Go to Matthew chapter number 16 real quick. We won't spend a long time there, but the principle of this comes from the idea of leaven. Jesus taught it. Jesus taught it. Very simply, the leaven the leaven that you see that's added to that dough so that it makes it rise, that type of leaven, spiritually speaking, will make the temperature of false teaching rise and corrupt a whole church. Jesus taught it. Verse number one, chapter 16 of Matthew. He's in the setting. It's very, very simple. He is at a place here where the Sadducees and the Pharisees are pursuing him because they want to tempt him. They want to flip him. They want to turn things around on him. And the they tempting him, it says in verse number one, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Verse two says, he answered and said unto them, what if, when it is evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red in the morning. It will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. He's saying, boy, you're really good at seeing signs and wonders from what the weather's going to be like. But verse, the second, the second part of verse number three says, oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot Ye, and, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no be, be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. And then he takes his disciples with them, and he then points out the leaven. And of course, as he goes through verse number 6 and 7, he says, hey, you need to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You saw me and how I was able, we were able to feed thousands of people with bread. And you think it's all about the physical part and the leaven that made the bread beautiful. No, it's the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all that they teach in false teaching that will corrupt and ruin, uh, ruin the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, hey, verse number seven, and they reason among themselves saying, is it because we've taken no bread? Because we forgot to bring the bread? What is it? Verse eight, Jesus, which when Jesus perceived it, said to them, O ye of little faith, why reason you yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand? Neither remember the five loaves, the five thousand, how many baskets we took up, the seven loaves of the four thousand, how many baskets ye took up? Remember, we just did that. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake not to you concerning bread, that you should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they now. Now they understood it. How that he bade them not Beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Sadducees and Pharisees. Go back to chapter number five. The false teachers can corrupt and destroy a church. The little leaven 
leaveneth the whole lump, and it can come anywhere, anyhow, with anyone. And it disrupts, it hinders, it troubles, it stops a church from completely living in the place that we ought to live. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, they in this church dealt with it, churches in history have dealt with it, and is as much of a, a sinful thing that can ruin a church as any other sin. And we're reminded that leaven often represents sin in the word of God and corruption in the scriptures. That the idea is that one rotten apple can spoil the whole bunch. Jesus taught it, Paul taught it, and now we see in the scriptures it's part of a false teaching, those false teachers. Two or three more here. Very simply this, three more on each verse Another characteristic of those false teachers. They will be judged for their heresy. They will be judged for their corruption. Moral corruption and theological and doctrinal corruption. They will be judged for it, it says in verse number 10. Say, hey, guess what? I have confidence in you that ye none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. Whosoever he be, they will face it. They will get it. God will take care of it and God will deal with it in his time. Because that leaven, if it comes, if that corruptible teaching, that false teaching comes, it will grab some following. It will have followers. And it will sound good for a period of time and it may go on for a while. And then when it's recognized and be dealt with, you say, wow, why didn't God stop that? It's amazing how many things we get into on our own and we want God to clean them all out. God says, hey, when I bring all of this and I allow this to come into your place, you need to deal with it possibly, immediately, or at least biblically on how those false teachers could corrupt with heresy and corruption morally and a theological, doctrinal, error of teaching. Those people are troublemakers. You ever been around a troublemaker? Those type of people never stop. They commit that type of trouble with someone, and if it doesn't last long, they go find somebody else. Troublemakers, oh my. And then verse number 11 and 12, a couple more characteristics of false teachers. They will, as it says there in verse number 11, persecute the faithful and true teachers. If I'm preaching the importance of the law, why am I being persecuted? He's saying, look, this is where the law sits. This is the way the law ought to be handled. This is the right way and the right place for the law. Why are you persecuting me when I'm telling you the truth? Remember, he even spoke of that in chapter number four. Why do you, think, why, why do you call me that person? Why do, you, why do you say that I'm some type of enemy to you? I'm not your enemy. I'm not someone who's come to you and said, hey, I'm trying to ruin your life. He said in Galatians 4, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Paul said, well, where did I become an enemy? I'm telling you the truth. False teachers will per persecute the ones that tell the truth. The offense that God's using here by Paul's teaching is very clear. The offense of the cross is that it's Salvation by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone and the offense of the cross is people that believes it, believe it needs to be a work salvation. It's salvation by grace. You as a lost person can't do anything to earn that salvation. The offense of the cross is clearly that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is all, all that we need for salvation. And Paul is saying, hey, is the offense of the cross ceased? Ha <laughs> ha, no way, because I'm going to keep on preaching the truth of the word of God. It's an attack on man's pride that he can't do something to earn his way to heaven. That's the offense of the cross. And lastly, what do we see here? What do we see here in verse 12? They should be cut off <laughs> to add any, any human effort, any work of human to the act of what God has done completely in Jesus Christ they should be dealt with and be cut off. 
his other thoughts and all that and how it really is being said as he relates to circumcision and those type of things. But it's very simply, I land on this place. If you will not submit clearly, if you're lost today and you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, please understand that the truth of the Word of God tells us, for by grace are ye saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Any false teacher that comes in and says there's some other way to Jesus Christ, they should be cut off because they're troubling you. And that's the way the devil works. He has a way of messing with things. He uses the leaven, the Judaizers, the false teachers, the Sadducees, the anti-grace people, the lie-abiding people that say, hey, just live your life like me. I don't understand why God doesn't check in with me. And they leave the Holy Spirit of God completely out of the walk of the Lord that we're to have. That no Holy Spirit presence in somebody's words and somebody's life clearly sends a message, and that's that they would rather abide by the law. You see, this is where the devil hinders things. When the devil hinders, he has a way of just bogging everybody down. He uses people. He doesn't necessarily have to be in this present per place in terms of this one situation or another. He only can be at one place at one time. He's still has to have that permission from holy God. But he will use scenarios and situations and people to mess with you and he will hinder you and trouble you and bewitch you to a place where you'll take the path of least resistance. You won't know the obstacles. You won't even be able to identify what's going on. And he'll say, ha, 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 I got you. Because the devil hinders he has a way of hindering the truth about who Jesus Christ really is. And he wants to hinder that statement Jesus Christ is it's said about him by John saying, the, Moses, the law came by Moses by grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Let me show you three simple things in the next few minutes that now we practically apply after we looked at some things about those false teachers. We might look up an extra verse or two or three in the next couple of minutes, but follow along with me. The first thing I want you to see is that when the devil hinders, many believers are inconsistent in running the race. You know, if I'm using that terminology, there's a good chance I might be using a passage or two here in a moment that are familiar with Paul's writings. Who cuts in on you when you are riding down the road with your car? I've got to get somewhere and I'm going so many miles an hour. Now, this is all speaking to all of you who never, ever speed. Okay, so none of you are ever in a hurry. You're never going fast. And then somebody cuts you off and you need to move over another lane. As my daughter Christine reminds me, Dad, why are you passing somebody on the right lane? And I go, is that illegal? Well, yes, it is. Okay. Well, I got cut off by somebody. I'm trying to use some excuse. So let's think about our spiritual walk and our race and our course that we're on. We're in a marathon. We're in a cross-country race. And many believers are inconsistent in running the race because they are hindered. They get cut off. This race that they're trying to run, an obstacle comes up. What should they do? How should we do it? Why don't you turn to Hebrews chapter number 12 real quick. I've got up on there 1 Corinthians 9, very familiar. And of course, Hebrews chapter number 12. It's a great, great passage. We like to go sometimes to some familiar passages because they resonate, uh, resonate with so much truth. And they, again, going back to the basics a lot of times, hey, this is what the Word of God's teaching us. This is the Word of God clearly, clearly telling us that we need to run the race. Pastor Bobby preached uh, a conference back in uh, 2015 out of these verses here. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth, easily, doth, doth so, so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us 
so easily besetting us makes me realize that when I put up there, many believers are inconsistent and they're running the race, it's not like I'm well, grasping. Hey, pastor, you're really grasping for something here. I don't have to grasp for anything. The Bible tells me that sin, which does so easily beset us, messes with us running the race. So let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Every one of you have a race that's set before you. Verse number two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The old phrase is when you're running a race, you keep your eyes forward. You take a peek either side with peripheral vision, but keep your eyes on the mark, on the prize. Keep your eyes forward on heaven, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of of the throne of God. Verse three, very, very important for you and me right here in the context of what we're seeing Paul teach as Jesus showed us and lived it out. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. If you think you're the only one that had to run through all the stuff that you're running through, the weights that you have to handle, the stuff that goes against you, in fact, Really clearly, it says in verse number three, to consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself. He had everyone against him, with the exception of a few. You and I love to have people in our corner. We love to have friends and fans, and we, oh, please, I hope you see my plight. I want you to, to help me. I want you to friend me. I want you to be, oh, I don't ever want to. Listen, sinners, if you walk for the Lord Jesus Christ, sinners are going to be against you. They are definitely going to want to stop you, and the devil's going to hinder you by making sure that there's plenty of them around, and they're going to say, you can mess with this for a little bit. You can mess with that with a little bit. Hey, the legalist says, Hey, you've fallen down, pick yourself up, do a few good things, say a five-minute devotion thing, have a little bit of prayer, and everything's going to be better. Until 30 days from now, when you crash again, the contradiction that's going to happen of the sinners against you that were against Jesus, you're going to say, Jesus isn't enough. He doesn't listen to you. He never really forgave you of everything. You're rotten. You're not good, and you're done. And now you're stuck. And the spirit of legalism does not suddenly just overpower a church. It takes a little time. It takes a little bit more time. And then it takes a little bit more time. It's introduced secretly. It grows a little. It grows a little. Everybody's got a little, I don't know what they're doing over there, but they need to get a little holier. Watch it. Watch it. Because the devil will hinder the church and get into a place where he'll say, hey, you can't run the race it's too hard. It's too tough. You've never had to run the race that Jesus Christ ran. And you have everything in Jesus Christ to run the same kind of race. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It says the Spirit of the Lord was, was upon Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ in Luke 4. And then Satan showed up to tempt him. And he answered him every step of the way. We know that to be common. We know to look at this passage of Scripture. We go, well, sure. Well, you don't understand, Brownie. You don't understand how tough it is. You don't understand, Pastor. Oh, yes, I do. I've got the same kind of flesh that you got. But I've got the same salvation that you have. And the Holy Spirit of God inside of me. I love favoring that side of standing fast wherewith, the therefore in the liberty which Jesus Christ has made us free. I am free. I am powerful in Christ, but I am weak in myself. I have grace that's sufficient for me because it says in the Bible that his grace is sufficient. When I think I've got enough strength and then I'm completely weakened and tired and worn out and I can't run the race and I'm inconsistent with the race, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. When you are in that place of complete weakness, I am strong. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. That's a whole lot better way of living your life than filled with law abiding foolishness that you think is going to make God happy. How about if you just obeyed him because you loved him? I said that to myself, you don't have to worry. 
it wasn't necessarily to you. The second thing when the devil hinders is that many believers are incapable of anticipating the obstacles. I like when they have those warning signs on the highway. They put the orange cones up. They put the the red things. You better merge over. You better merge over. You better merge over. And then you have the people after you who you've already merged over. You've asked for help. You've waved to the person say, thank you for letting me in. And then you got somebody that ignored the obstacle. And they're going 70 down the left lane. They need to merge over and they can't. So now their obstacle is about 50 cars that won't let them in. And most of them are you. So I ain't letting them in. I ain't letting them in. Then, you know, just as I am in heaven, God's going to bring up this driver and remind me. That's what we're crazy. How about just I love Jesus Christ so much, I'm just going to do this thing. It's not a big deal. The obstacles that are in our lives are real. They're really real. How would I handle all of them? Go to James chapter number 1. I've got Ephesians 4 and James 1 up there. You know what obstacles I'm talking about and how to anticipate them? How in the world would you anticipate obstacles? How about if you ask someone that's been through this, walk with the Lord for 20 or 30 years? Why don't you look around and say, boy, I'd maybe go up and maybe I should go talk to Miss Pam about how she handles ministry things in her life and what it was like to you know, have kids and life and even ask her what it feels like to finally marry off her last child. But as a woman, maybe you'd ask somebody who is a woman of grace and a woman of a walk in the liberty in Christ some wisdom on how to handle something. Think she could walk through something with you, Susan? Hey, guys, how do I get through some of the obstacles and identify them? Guys, I just want you to know you're in a church here that's filled with dozens of men that walk with the Lord, that understand the liberty in Christ, that understand the Word of God, that understand what the Spirit of God can do versus the Spirit of man and following. Why don't you go talk to them? Go ask them to point you in the direction of the Word of God. What would you do? How would you handle these obstacles? And that would help me to anticipate the next obstacle that's happening. Like when my kids become teenagers. It says in James chapter number 1, I know you're not far away. Verse number 5 we can grab. I didn't put it up there. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And it shall be given him. Wow. So you go to God first. I kind of left that out on purpose because I know the word of God would speak to you. Why don't you go to God first about the obstacles and how you handle them. Verse number 6 says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. When we are bewitched, hindered, and troubled, we get interrupted a little bit. It says in verse number 7, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. That man that says, hey, nothing, I'm not going to do it in faith. I just need to handle this myself. And you don't want to be in that place, which verse number 8 says, of being a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways. I would ask you to consider to favor the wisdom of God, the wisdom of those that have walked with the Lord for a while. And don't ask so that you can selfishly get through one little thing. Ask so that you would know how to identify an obstacle, that you would then say, I can anticipate the obstacle, and I could just then know how to handle some of those things. You see, men, women, couples, families, the devil will hinder you when you do not look at these incredibly crazy obstacles in your life, and you say, hey, I don't know what to do. And then you sit there and make a choice listening to somebody you work with that doesn't have any clue about the Bible. Instead of asking God who has wisdom and he will deal it out to you. He's not being self-righteous and, and, you know, full of yourself. He's saying, no, you're not going to get anything like that. Why don't you go to God in faith? Why don't you go to a brother or sister in the Lord by faith? Why don't you ask someone to give you 
some direction. There's so much wisdom surrounding you, church, in the body of Christ. By the word, by the spirit, someone can give you some great counsel. And you know what you want to hear more than anything else is within the first three minutes they say to you, this is what the Bible says. This is what the word of God says. This is what God showed me and taught me. This is what got me through that obstacle. You will be able to identify it when it's coming. And when you need me, call me. I will be there. I promise you, if you need me, if I can be there, but I promise you I'll do it in the spirit of God, by the word of God, or else it's going to be a useless time. It'll be all for vanity. I will be of no help to you. One of the places that the devil will hinder, and we'll finish here, when the devil hinders many believers are indolent in overcoming the evildoers. Now, you have to admit that's a pretty cool word. I spent like half an hour looking for this word. I couldn't remember it. I knew it because my mother would tell me that this is who I was. You know, my mom was so smart. Indolent means very simply inaction. It's a person that lacks movement and action over a matter. You're lazy. Now, if I put lazy up there, you go, oh, that's nice. But indolent, you know. Many believers are indolent over overcoming the evil doers. Go to 1 Peter. You're there. You're really not far away. 1 Peter chapter 1. Think of what it says up there. Put it right back real quick and then we'll go to that slide. Put it right back for a second. Many believers are indolent in overcoming the evil doers. You know that there's some evil doers around? <laughs> They're everywhere. They like to mess with us. You have the Holy Spirit of God. You have the Word of God. So here it is, 1 Peter, chapter number 1. <clears throat> it says in verse number 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as, ye ha excuse me, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. We forget, we forget when these evildoers are coming after us and messing with us and, and we don't know what to do and how to do it and how to handle it. What do I do? How do I do it? What do I do? How do I handle it? When the devil hinders you, don't be indolent in overcoming the evildoers. Go to the Lord, gird up your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought into you. As obedient children, don't return back. Here's where I'm going. Don't return back to that lost life of that old conversation and go, ah, oh, I can just come up with some kind of answer. I'll just Google it. When the devil hinders believers, we need not to be indolent, but realize that in overcoming the evildoers, we go to the Lord and say, hey, I'm not going to return back the old way I used to live. I need to go into this place of where he can make me holy. He's going to make you holy. Stay with it. It might take a decade or two or three, but stay with it. Because when we're hindered and we fall down, we need to say, this is a race that I need to run. There's obstacles that are going to be there. And I need to learn how to overcome those evildoers. Today I just want you to consider this question here in our invitation time. Would you search your heart to identify the who? Who hinders you? Who is hindering you from obeying the truth? Because the truth of the word of God, Paul the apostle said very clearly, when he stated in Galatians chapter number 5, hey, believers, brethren, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Maybe there's 
that person the devil's using to hinder you, that you need to say, no, I need to obey the truth. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we come to you at this time knowing how much we desperately in need of you working in our hearts. Father, your word is clear. You have taught us from some hard teaching and some hard writings what Paul the Apostle is conveying to the church. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. The devil hinders that. We are often hindered. I pray for your brother, my brothers and sisters for your church that truly today we would identify that which is in the way of us truly living in that free, free, beautiful grace and salvation that we have. Please bless in our invitation in Jesus' name. Please stand.